I, I assume that's got to be really important when you're making an investment decision. You know, if I if I'm asking Chat GPT to to do some analysis, you kind of want to know if it's you know, you know, some Joe Schmo putting out the information or somebody who actually knows what they're talking about. I don't, I don't know. Well, this is interesting because this question of democratization, like you might have a a tool like Chat GPT that everybody has access to. But at the end of the day, these models all work off of information. And a lot of the information that we get is proprietary, right? We pay for it. Um, you happen to work for an organization that's quite, yeah. quite protective of the information. Yeah, I think we and are. Can you imagine how any model that would make some financial predictions, um, if it doesn't have access to your database and all of your information, how accurate or good can it really be? And so at the end of the day, these models have to feed off of information and the quality of the information um, really is gonna determine how good the model is. And so, um, you know, as much as we talk about democratization, I still see it as more um, this kind of arms race where we're gonna have the biggest asset managers, um, the most profitable ones have access to a lot more information than let's say a smaller manager. Um, and so, um, you know, you do worry about this sort of um, tyranny that incumbents might have, particularly as asset management becomes a more consolidated industry, is that um, you really may not be able to democratize. In fact, it might become a very undemocratic environment, particularly for individuals who will never be able to uh, uh, have the resources to be able to make the kind of decisions that that we think these AI systems can, can do. They won't have access to the information. They already don't have access to a lot of this information, but you can imagine it only getting worse in the future. Harry? Yeah, I was gonna say, um, specifically since you brought up Bloomberg, Bloomberg does protect themselves for this. They have a product that I wanted to train a model on. and uh, It was called their events news alert system. So it's a very premium system already. It's quite expensive. So only elite funds can, can afford it. And they, when I told our legal department that we were going to try training a model on it because we wanted to see uh, you know, how tradable the information was and, and do some analytics, we had limitations of what we could do contractually and we ended up not doing it. We evaluated it and found that it was, uh, it was quite useful but couldn't be used for training. So you can buy it if you want to use it. And I think that's fair. I mean, I was a little bit of annoyed at the time because I, I was looking forward to using it. But. There's some really interesting parallels going on here. I think many of you were around when the internet kind of, you know, started out, you know, and, and, uh, and everybody thought, oh, access to the internet, that's going to, you know, break down a lot of the silos. It's going to democratize the world and you're going to have all these different, you know, websites and each one is as easy to get to as the other. And what do we find out? You know, it consolidates back to, to the Googles or to the Charles Schwabs of the world or to the large players in, in this whole idea of democratization. Actually, I wouldn't say it doesn't work, or, but, but this, I think people like brands, people, you know, trust is still important. Um, you know, we trust Google, we trust Amazon, we trust Charles Schwab or whoever, you know. Uh, you know, uh, Jake looks like you want to... This does seem to be the natural tendency. There's a very large infrastructural layout, a huge, a huge investment that these companies need to make to sustain and provide these services, and it's going to consolidate. So I, I don't see a, I don't see a force that's going to break it up necessarily. And even even if there's some disruptor, they'll very quickly be absorbed by one of the dominant players to capture that rent. I, I'll, I'll take the contrarian view there, being the being the small vendor, uh, the small the small boutique vendor. Uh, I disagree that more is better. I do believe that better is better. And uh, we've made a business over 20 years of working with you know, very high-end market makers, hedge funds, and folks like that who want the best. And face it, you know, in investment management, it's about getting an edge and not doing what everybody else does having something that's a little bit better. I mean, that goes back to, you know, the Trojan War thousands of years ago. Having slightly better data will give you a better result. And so, um, well, I'll stop there. No, no. Well, I, I think we'd, everybody would agree, but the real question is, 
is all data good all the time. And one of the things we've, really, we've learned, if you've been on the street long enough, there are going to be at points in time where certain data is more valuable than others, and there's cyclicality to it. And then the question is, well, how many of these data sources are you able to buy and know when to be switching to different factor analysis and things like that? So I completely agree. There's always going to be an interesting market for folks like you who are generating interesting, unique data. My kids are data. relatively well fed. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, but then the real question is, how many of these can you subscribe to? They're often, over time, I'm just even thinking of offline information services. And uh, I'm so old, like I was around at the time when you used to get newsletters or uh, uh, weekly, uh, you know, sort of things that were sent uh, in the mail, like the snail mail. Um, and some were better than others, and some were really good for certain periods of time, and others are better at other periods of time. So that I don't think ever changes, right? Like that's always going to probably be the case, and there's always going to be um, an opportunity for new data providers to kind of say, hey, we have an interesting way to look at data, or we're capturing an interesting thing that we don't think other people are. And yeah, you know, you might have to try that and kind of incorporate it into your AI, if you, if you think of like your AI as being like just the operating system, right? And then all these other kind of pipes that are feeding information into it to you know, sort of applications, then you can then kind of customize. Um, it's kind of a never ending process, I think, of continually looking for data, continually improving, trying to. So that's really interesting. Um, you know, your, your AI model. So if each of us were running the same AI model, depending upon you know, how we access it, how we think, how we ask questions, we would wind up getting different answers. Um, and also, is that, is that kind of how you, you, you think about it? And, and does this, you know, almost be this whole idea of everybody consolidating into one huge database AI model is probably not going to be the one that, the model that actually survives. It's going to be everybody looking at it a little bit differently. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure everybody's heard there's whole new field of prompt engineering. So it's all about the prompt, right? It's all about the questions you ask and how you shape it and kind of how you're informed by that question. And that, that really draw, drives the model uh, a great deal. So that, that kind of convergence, I think, is probably less likely unless everybody is, their brain is removed and everybody is uh, asked the same kind of questions and has the same perspective. I think it has a lot to do with, you know, what you're, you know, even back to you know, early days trading strategies before uh, a lot of this is like kind of what is your market position? What are you, you know, what are you, what are you seeing in your data sets and the news and the overlay that you've, you've, you've done for yourself um, in your own preparation? And, you know, it's all about the kind of questions that you ask. I think maybe um, the underlying question here about like, is AI going to replace humans? I think the more interesting um, perspective is to think of AI as really augmenting human intelligence. Think of it as kind of like a, a farmer who uses a combine, right? Like you can go out there with hoes and shovels and how much land can you really till in a day, right? right? But you get on one of those big shiny, you know, John Deere combines and suddenly you can do multiples uh, of what you would have done otherwise. And I think that's really what we should be viewing, at least in the short term, that AI is here to be like a tool for human intelligence. It's, it's there for you to uh, make decisions, hopefully with better information, calling through a bunch of stuff um, that you might not be able to have time to do. And um, I think that that in itself, if you just position and think of it as augmenting human intelligence, well, then suddenly you would start asking very, very not different so questions, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. And not fearing it, but just sort of saying, well, how, how, can, I, how can I use this piece of of machinery to help my job and make me do better things every day, right? Yeah. Improve performance. So I, I, I couldn't agree more. Your, 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 your question that said, you know, we're all going to pump in specific data to maybe even the exact same AI system and get different answers. You, you could consider that a bug of this system. I actually consider it a feature where that an augmented human who understands it, that, that enhances their edge. They become more competitive. And, and that is going to be the landscape of AI. It's not, it's not a, a bot replacing the human. It's a human augmented, a human plus AI that really takes over the investment management, the data cleaning, the, the systems generation. So where similar, you, we've, we've seen this in chess, right? Right. Remember when, you know, what is it now? It's 26 years since, you know, uh, Kasparov was beaten. But 
you would think like, who, what human wants to play chess anymore? But actually chess has become more popular than it's ever been. You have team chess, what they call centaur chess, where you have uh, teams of people and their computers play other people and their computers. Um, and that to me actually seems like a very good image of what investment management is gonna be in the future. 